Welcome to Empire Building. I'm Wendy Papazan, and together with my four co-hosts, we bring you weekly unfiltered conversations about leadership, growing a big empire, and living on your own terms. I'm Kimber Lovett Minkiti. We are investors and wealth builders with over 75 million in combined net worth. I'm Sarah Reynolds. We are visionaries who've built more than 50 businesses with over 122 million in annual revenue. I'm Tiffany Fikes. We've led thousands of people and do it all while being pretty good moms. And I'm Seychelle Van Poole. We are your podcast to learn how to build big businesses and even bigger lives. Hi, everyone. Welcome to a new week on the Empire Building podcast. Today, it's Seychelle, Tiffany, and Sarah. And we are so excited to be with you today. Hopefully, you guys had a great weekend and are ready to make this week even better. So today, we're going to talk about something that I believe to be the absolute most important part of getting a yes in sales. So what's the most important part? We have a secret. We're about to tell you a secret. I love secrets. Sarah, what is the secret in sales? (laughs) What's the secret? Well, it's simple. The answer is simple, okay? It's actually using open-ended questions to get to their true motivation and their why, and to use what we call reflective listening to ask deeper questions for them to fully feel cared for. We know that if the person we're talking to, either on the phone or in person, if they don't feel cared for by us, if they're not doing the majority of the talking, we know that they actually won't feel care. And many times it's very hard, almost impossible, to get a yes in sales if the buyer or seller or whatever you're selling, right, if they don't feel cared for. So today we are going to dive in to how you actually do this. How do you accomplish asking open-ended questions and truly getting to the why? I love it. And open-ended questions are so important. And at some point in this episode, I'm going to share a game that our team plays around open-ended questions. I know. Stay alert. (laughs) Stay listening. But you first start with, okay, why? Why do open-ended questions matter? And the reality is a closed question ends the conversation. You say, are you planning to move soon? And they say, yes. And then it's awkward. And like, who's next? Are they supposed to keep talking? Are you supposed to keep talking? Like, it doesn't help the conversation at all. So open-ended conversations encourage conversation. They allow people to know that you want to hear more than just yes. So that, are you planning to move soon? If I were to ask you, Seychelle, what inspired you to consider selling your home now? Yeah. You would jump right in. I would jump right in and say, you know, well, our house is too small or, you know, I'm driving an hour each way and I don't like my commute. But it, it inspires me to think about what is actually prompting that. Yeah. Yeah. Which then leads you to the real motivation. You know, you're getting real motivation And you're also building trust. Anytime someone shares something real with you, it builds trust. Yeah, so like open-ended questions, right, means that the answer can't be yes or no, which then would pause the conversation is what Tiffany is saying. It is typically a what, why, tell me more about that type of question versus did, do, is this, Those questions you want to try to stay away from. But open-ended questions certainly encourage conversation. They help you know what the person is that you're talking to, what really matters to them. And P.S., this works when you're trying to sell your kids on something or your husband. (laughs) You know, like all of your life, you can use this. This is really how to get a yes in life. Let's just, let's call it what it is. I have a question. When you're asking these open-ended questions, and we're going to give a lot of examples today of of some great ones to use, specifically in business, do you ever find, like, as you were learning to do this, that it's hard to keep yourself disciplined to stay quiet and truly and actively listen? Like, Sarah, you mentioned at the beginning, right? Like, I loved the phrase that you were using of reflective listening. I've never heard it phrased like that, and I loved that. Like, how do you discipline yourself to, like, really be actively listening and in the moment on that? 
Yeah, great question. And I definitely think that we're going to dive into that today a little bit more. But I think what I'm hearing say ask and what I think our listeners need to ask, if, if you're a natural closer, like for example, I'm a natural closer. Like I like to get to the end and ask for it. And like I'm naturally closing the entire time. I have found that natural closers love yes or no questions because it's a closing question. Like the time that you ask a non-open-ended question, it's a closed question, is actually when you are closing for the business. That's the only time. But what leads up to it needs to be open-ended questions. So if you are in the category of me, like meaning if you're listening and you're like, I like to just get to it, I'm aggressive, I go for I'm not afraid to ask for the business. Just know you're actually going to lose a good amount of business if you don't first get really good at showing care and asking open-ended questions. But it's definitely been something I have had to really be intentional about and realize that if they don't feel cared for by me, if they're not doing the majority of the talking. So my rule, I was so bad at it that I had a timer on my phone when I would walk into an appointment for 30 minutes and it would buzz in my pocket. And then that is when I could start getting a little bit more aggressive. So 30 minutes, I would give myself to ask open-ended questions. And I would put on the top of my paper, what, why, tell me more about that, on the top of just a blank piece of paper to remind myself, do not ask a question with do, did, is, because those questions were more natural to me. And so if you're a very direct person, you need to be really listening today because this is something that probably is not natural for you. Like it has not been natural for me. And so just little sort of tactics on what I did to get better in this area because it's definitely been, I've had to grow. Same here. I think that's an amazing piece of advice that if you don't have that on your appointments for whatever business role you're in, whether it's interviewing, whether it's selling something, whether it's closing. I think that's a fantastic thing that everybody should have at the top of their list. That's awesome. Well, and maybe it's just us, but like we're all not wired to ask open-ended questions. I don't think it's just us. You don't think it's just us? You think it's everybody? Okay. Well, so what I had to do was I spent time every week writing down like creating, mm-hmm. basically, open-ended questions because I didn't know what to say. And we'll already get to my game. So then what we started to do in our team meeting one time, somebody got their desk like Dwight Schrooted with foil instead of <laughs> wrapping paper on their birthday. It was like totally <laughs> covered. They like collected all the foil off their desk and made this ball. And then they're like... We've had this foil ball in our office that we would throw at each other or, you know, mess around with. And then one day I was like, we're going to play the open-ended question game and we're going to throw the ball. And whoever catches the ball has to ask an open-ended question. And it just bounces around until somebody's out when they run out of open-ended questions. And it could be about anything. But you become so aware of how hard it is to ask open-ended questions when you do that. So good. I love it. So we're getting leadership tips today and also open-ended questions. Your homework is going to be having a list of at least 10. So I found to do a true 30-minute deep dive, if you have 10, I mean, honestly, it could last, if you're doing good reflective listening, it can last almost an hour to an hour and a half. So I always had 10 sort of in my pocket, like in my weapons in terms of every appointment to use, to pull from, depending on how the conversation goes. But let's keep talking about, so we know why, okay, why are we use open-ended questions, right? As Tiffany said, it encourages conversation, it reveals motivation, it builds trust because they truly feel cared for. What are the sort of the goals of asking open-ended questions? So there's three goals the three of us are going to talk about here, but the three goals are to uncover motivation, which is to find out the why Why are they making a move? Why do they want to purchase a home? Why are they looking to join your coaching program? Or why are they looking to buy your cup that you sell? It helps better position them to actually guide decisions, okay? Because the truth is, is that it's really hard to get a yes in sales if you don't help them navigate guiding decisions. I was sharing with my team earlier this week, you know, they say that the majority of the population are SC disc types, right? So they're steady and they're conscientious. A high C's biggest fear is making a wrong decision, Mm -hmm. right? 
So if you don't get good at helping guide them to make a decision, right, it's going to be very hard to get that yes. The second sort of goal with asking open-ended questions is to discover priorities, right? So understand what's most important to them in the process. So it could be timeline, it could be price, it could be a smooth transaction or smooth transition for their family. Every situation, they have a priority list. They could prioritize that. So when you ask open-ended questions, you can actually discover their priorities. And then the third real quick, and then we're going to talk about some examples, is to build rapport, right? Asking open-ended questions then builds rapport to where they feel heard and understood. So I think one of the most important things of asking open-ended questions is that often people don't know their motivation or their priorities. They know the answer to, do I want to buy a house? Yes. Okay. Tell me more about that. They sometimes have not really processed through all of that. And so you're actually offering a service to them. Like you are helping them process all the stuff that's in their brain about what are those things or why do I want to do this or what is important to me about this that will help them solidify that this is in fact something they want to do. We tell our team all the time, like you uncover their motivation almost before they come in the doors with us, because you want to be able to help remind them of their motivation throughout the sales process, because they're going to forget or get distracted. And if you truly know their motivation, then you can help them get over whatever that emotion is at the time later in the process, especially when you're selling real estate, that might feel hard. But you can't do that if they don't know their motivation and you don't know their motivation. Everybody's just looking at houses. It's the blind, leading the blind. Yeah. Or maybe the really knowledgeable leading the blind, that could be too. (laughs) You know, the something that you really sparked for me, Tiffany, with that comment as well is oftentimes in a really big purchase, whether it's a piece of real estate or maybe a car or like in a larger ticket item, you probably have one or two or more decision makers in the room as well. And so oftentimes I have found one person has a very strong driving motivation and the other person can sometimes be the drag along motivated. And so really taking the time to slow down and ask open-ended questions can make sure that everybody is on the same page with motivation. They all are discovering what their motivation is and each side can feel heard and seen. Whereas sometimes if you just let the dominant person in the decision-making do the talking, you're actually missing what the real motivating factor is. So that's a big piece of it too. Let's share with our listeners some examples. What's an example of a question that we can ask to uncover motivation? One I love is like either what prompted you to pick up the phone today or what had you pick up the phone today or what had you come meet with me today with buying or selling your home? I love that. We always ask at open houses, what brought you in today? Mm -hmm. it's disarming. That's not what they're expecting. And there's nothing to do except answer that with real information. (laughs) Sometimes they'll say too, like, how did you find us? Yeah, that's good. Uncovering motivation. Another one would be like, maybe what's prompting you to sell at this stage of your life? Mm -hmm. So if you're really wanting to get to their motivation, the why behind selling, right? So like what's going on in your life right now that's prompting you to be thinking about making a move, right? Those are all really good examples of getting to the why. And then discovering priorities. One example that we like to use is what's most important to you in this selling process? If you had to pick between price, timeline, smooth transaction, which one would you put at the top of the list, right? To truly understand what's their number one priority. Because what can happen sometimes is that for me, at least when I'm hearing all of their needs or all of the things that they want, Mm -hmm. you know, we almost look at them as equal. Yes, that's right right? And through serving thousands of buyers and sellers over the years, I found out they're actually not equal for anyone. They do have a priority list. Now, every priority list is different depending on their situation. But asking what's most important to you in the selling process and having them almost vocalize their priority list is so powerful. It's also so powerful for them, as Tiffany said earlier. Yeah. Well, and we always in like uncovering priorities, we have them identify it. That question is great. We also ask, okay, what about that is important to you? Like digging deeper into each of the priorities. And then 
once they've identified, okay, here's our top five priorities, or we call them, you know, must-haves, then we actually go one step further and we actually go two steps further. And we say, all right, if the perfect house came on the market, but it didn't have one of these things, what would that be? And ask them to even further prioritize. Like they think, oh, these five, I can't do anything without all these five characteristics of a home or, you know, whatever it is. Asking them to even get rid of one more helps them make decisions in the house once we're there. You know, it helps them get to that yes faster. Well, and I love that. And what Tiffany's modeling for you all is when you're asking these open-ended questions to dig a little further and ask follow-up questions to make sure everybody's on the same page. And I love that those are excellent examples of that. You know, I think something I always like to ask too is like to define it. Because if somebody says we need a big backyard, well, a big backyard to me versus a big backyard to them might actually be very different. And so like being able to say, you know, we need a big backyard. Say, okay, well, what does a big backyard mean to you? Or what does a big backyard feel like to you? And, you know, helping them to narrow that down. So you're both really looking at their goals through the same lens is also really helpful. And then mirroring it back to them is called reflective listening. And so when you're repeating the key points back, so if Tiffany said, you know, well, actually I need something that is at least a quarter acre of a lot or bigger. And I say, okay, so what I'm hearing is, is you need at least a quarter of an acre. Does it matter how big the house is on that, right? Like get them really specific to where you can envision what they're physically seeing in their mind. You're able to actually envision with them as well and to let them know that you have heard them and that you're all on the same page. And that reflective listening that Sarah was talking about earlier helps encourage them to be able to share what they're looking for openly and without feeling like you're just trying to sell them something and instead allowing them to be the consultant. You'd asked earlier, how do you make yourself not talk or make yourself listen and reflect back? So I make myself take notes. Like I ask a question and pick up my pen. Like physically, I set it down. And then every time I ask a question, I pick it up again to help remind me to take notes and write down what they say so that I could use their actual words. What Tiffany's sharing right now is actually a hack of a body movement that actually shows care. Do you guys know that when someone is speaking and if someone on the other side is taking notes, do you know that the person speaking automatically feels cared for? Yes. And so when you're writing it down, they will feel cared for because that means that you care enough about what they're saying to write it down. And so I love that hack, Tiffany. I also did the same thing. In addition to that, having a lot of space. So when you come up with your 10 questions, right? Don't just put 10 in a row. Mm. You're going to put one question and then have space. And then if you're like me (laughs) and really need to grow in this area, then you want to put like question one after it, question two. So my rule was I can't move on to the second question that I had on my list without first asking two more questions about the answer that they gave. Ooh, I love that. On our team, we call it three going three levels deep. So they give you the first answer, and then you're going second level deep, then third level deep on the answer that they gave. So you're asking follow-up questions, right? And so we call this effective questioning. So it's never just the first question. It's asking that follow-up question, as Seychelle said, and then using reflective listening, repeating what they said, and then asking a another follow-up question, right? So like as an example, might say something like, well, it sounds like being closer to your parents is really important to you. What other factors are influencing this move, right? So when they say, well, I'm moving because I want to be close to my parents, a lot of salespeople just move on and they write, okay, they're moving because they want to be close to their parents. And then you think you know their true why. Well, typically it's more than just that, right? So then asking those follow-up questions and then Really repeating what they said also is a way of showing care because they then know that she heard me. She understands that that's important to me. Yeah. And don't summarize it. Use their actual words. I'm not saying you have to say every word that they've said, but you know, if they said close to my mom and pop, like don't say close to your parents because that is different words. And so you want to be close to your mom and pop. I love that. You know, like, tell me more about why that's important to you. That's a great pro tip. Yeah, like, use their actual words. So if you write it down and you repeat it back with their actual words, you're triple caring for them. Like, they will just be blown against the wall with all the care that you have for them. I love it. Okay, so let's give some examples. Let's talk about 
How can we use this? Let's make our tin. How about that, ladies? I love it. I love it. Okay, so what is your biggest concern about selling right now? I love that as an open-ended question because I like disarming questions and they think you're there to make them sell their house and asking them what concerns they have feels almost like you're not trying to make them sell their house. It's just, I think it's a rapport building question as well as a motivation finder or maybe a priority finder question. So that would be one I would give an example of. One of my favorites is where are you going to go once we get this house sold? And then why is that location important to you? Right. Then you can dig three deep on that, right? Like, where are you going to go? And then why is that important? And then what will that do for you is another way to follow that up. Yep. Going back to what Tiffany said about the concerns one, you know, so many times people make decisions like either running from pain or moving to something that they're truly desiring. If you know their concerns or a pain point they have, that will help you so much later on in the conversation when you go to objection handling. And so I really love that question, Tiffany. Let's see, if you're in real estate, right? One question that I love to ask buyers is, what features of this home do you think are most valuable, right? Or a seller, like what features of this home were most valuable to you when you purchased it, right? Because most likely what was most important to you is gonna be most important to the buyer. And so we wanna know about that. Love that. What does a successful sale look like to you? Or Mm -hmm. one thing that I always say is if you could snap your fingers and everything work out perfectly, what would that look like for you? Yes. Mm -hmm. What is winning? You're basically asking them what is winning. Mm -hmm. And that's such a helpful bit of information to know about them as your clients. Yeah. Another one that we like is how do you define five-star service? That's one we use too. Mm -hmm. Because... Everyone defines five-star service different. We also many times ask, how do you define good communication? Because a lot of times I found that when I asked, like, what's most important to you in your decision with choosing a realtor today? So many sellers will say, we need good communication. Someone we can trust and we want good communication. Mm -hmm. Well, I could ask Tiffany and Seychelle right now how they define good communication, and I'm going to get two different answers. Absolutely. And so getting deeper on their definition of it is also some great open-ended questions as well. Anytime you're asking, because Say has already talked about it, Sarah's talked about it, anytime you're asking them to define what exactly that looks like to them, that's an open-ended question. Yes, If you just walk around asking people to define the words that they're using, you're asking open-ended questions. And it's great. People actually love it. So, If they've had an experience before in buying or selling a product, I always like to ask them, like, what made that experience really great for you? Or what made that experience not so great for you? Just depending on, you know, if they share, oh, well, we've moved a million times and we know what we're doing or we weren't successful in our experience before, I always love to say, well, what do you wish had gone differently? Or what about that experience didn't feel like a win for you? Kind of tells you what not to do. Let's think of one or two, maybe three. What are some rapport building open-ended questions? What made you purchase this home? And then talking about their home. A lot of times they'll talk about their kids, pets, because that's what drove it. Mm -hmm. And so then you're building a deeper relationship with understanding them might be a good one. I like to do about the community too. Like, tell me something about Mm -hmm. the area that, you know, an outsider or a relocation person might not know that we need to make sure that we're talking about. And it kind of gets them talking about the community or their street or, you know, where they live. I love open-ended questions. They just serve so many purposes because like that, that's building rapport. That's also giving you, you're going to use their words in your sales material, which they're going to feel cared for. I mean, can we think of anything wrong with an open-ended question? I can't think of anything. I can. Okay, great. (laughs) When it's time to close. Oh, yes. (laughs) That's where I was going. Yeah. Yeah. Because you will get tripped up if you ask an open-ended question when you're doing your best to ask for the business and you're asking an open-ended question. But again, that should be your first closed question, should be actually the closing question when you're asking for the business. But you need to earn the right to ask that question. That was the other piece I was going to say, Sarah, is I've actually seen really hard-driving salespeople 
think that they are doing open-ended questions because they're asking them, but they're not using reflective listening and they're not taking notes and they're not paying attention. And actually what it does is it feels like a real jerk move because it's like, well, you're asking me all these questions, but you're not even really listening to what I'm saying. All you want is my business. And so I've seen that backfire where the salesperson's like, but I asked all these questions. And it's like, yeah, but you didn't listen to anything they had to say. You were so focused on the clothes that you didn't pay attention. And then they got really ticked (laughs) that you were even there. So I have seen that, like, where if you don't slow down, it can backfire. We were doing reviews of our leaders at Empower Home, and one of our department heads gave a pretty hard review of one of our leaders. And they said that they ask open-ended questions, but it's they then spin the answer for their gain. Mm-hmm. So they felt like they don't really care what I did this weekend because they want to then like throw that in my face later on in the conversation. It was brutal. The point is, is that when you're asking open-ended questions, make sure you truly care about hearing them is what we're saying. Well, and it comes to when you ask open-ended questions, you have power. You have gained power in the conversation. It's why it works as a sales technique, but you need to be responsible with that power and use it for good. You know, like you're learning these things about them to help them get what they want, not Mm. to throw it in their face later. You know, like come from the care because you are getting really, really important information from whomever you're asking open-ended questions, whether it's your kid or an employee or a client and be the person worthy of what they're sharing with you. That's so good, Tiffany. That leads us to sort of our last point today, but maybe arguably the most important is, you know, after you have 20 to 30 minutes of open-ended questions, reflective listening, going two to three levels deep on what they have said, you then want to use their answer throughout the later selling process, right? So you know their priority list. You know now their true motivation. So you want to build sort of a sales presentation that addresses all of the common things that are important to the buyer or seller or whatever industry that you're in. And then you're not going to actually go through all of it. You're going to use what they said to then highlight in your sales process how you're the best person for the job. Really, once you uncover the why, you then guide the conversation to then focus on then leading you to earn the right to ask for the business. And so an example of that, let's say when you ask the priority question, right, what's most important to you in this process? Is it timing? Is it price? Is it a smooth transaction? And they say price, right? And you go, why is price the most important to you? They tell you, well, I need this much amount of money to get to Florida, Oh, okay. So Florida, why Florida, right? What's drawing you to Florida? Okay. And so you know then why it's important to them prices and then Florida. So then you're giving your presentation after that 30 minutes of asking open-ended questions. And then you're on a slide that says that you get them more money than the average agent as an example, right? And you said, you know, I want you to get to Florida and I want you to get to Florida for the most amount of money. And so our team is known in the market to get our sellers the most amount of money. And so one of the reasons why many people that have big goals like you do in terms of netting the most amount of money choose to work with our team is because we end up getting 6.1% more money on average. And so I know that you're going to get more money for this Florida move when we partner together in your home sale. And so like you're using what they said to sort of the why they're going to hire you, why they're going to say yes. If you didn't know that and you're just talking about getting top dollar and not tying it to them, they're going to feel like it's all about you and you're bragging. Mm -hmm. Whereas it's not about bragging. It's about truly tying what you do that's different to what they're needing and what they told you they need. I love that. I think that's so, so, so important. And it also allows you, most of you as business people have multiple things that you do really well. It's not like you just are a one trick pony. And so by uncovering the motivation and by really understanding what their motivation is, you can use that then to get to the point of it and not have, feel like you have to barf your sales pitch all over them, which is what a lot of salespeople do because they they can't figure out which one they have to give you. So they're going to give you 20. Yes. And it's not necessary. If you can really get to the heart of the issue, you can be much more targeted with your sales approach. It's not salesy at that point because it feels like it was made for them. Exactly. And you are. You're making it in real time with the notes that you just took for the last 30 minutes with that 
I mean, I think that tip, Sarah, of like putting an alarm on your phone and like not allowing yourself. Yes. Oh my gosh, that's gold. So like you've got 30 minutes of open-ended questions that you're then going to use their words with your presentation. And it's not sales at that point. There, It's destiny. <laughs> like, how is it that yeah. I showed up? And this is all about me. It's just so smooth. So the more we know about our clients, the better we can serve them. And open-ended questions are the keys that we have to unlocking the motivation and making sure that the sales process for them is smooth and successful. So I love this. I have a ton of notes and I cannot wait. I'm going to start the timer. I hope you all play the foil ball game with open-ended yes. questions with your team. It's going to be a great week of asking some really great questions. I love it. Well, thanks guys for joining us today as always. And we want you to get out there and build a big business and you can build a big business. The more you get better at asking open-ended questions, boy, can you build a big business? Because this also applies to interviewing people mm-hmm. for your teams and businesses as well. But we want you to get out there and build a big business. But it's so important for our podcast mission is we do not want anyone building a big business without also building an even bigger life. So figure out this week how you're going to implement asking open-ended questions, but also don't forget, what are you going to do this week to build that bigger life? Bye guys. Bye. Have a great week. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. The views, thoughts, and opinions of the guest represent those of the guest and not KWRI and its affiliates and should not be construed as financial, economic, legal, tax, or other advice. This podcast is provided without any warranty or guarantee of its accuracy, completeness, timeliness, or results from using the information. 